NASA's robot just spotted a perfect doorway carved into Martian rock like someone left it there on purpose, and it is barely big enough for a child to crawl through. That one strange photo made the internet explode with wild ideas, secret tunnels, tiny aliens, and ancient ruins on the red planet. Let us zoom in right now on the photo that could prove something is still moving beneath Mars's surface. The picture came from a robot that's been rolling around Mars, snapping photos and digging up clues. On the seventh day of May, that camera caught what looked like a slice of something unusual. It wasn't jagged, it wasn't messy, it looked like someone cut into the rock on purpose, like a passage carved by hand. Under that line, shiny metal showed up. That was all it took. The crowd online exploded. Message boards, videos, pictures with circles and arrows. People went wild. Theories started pouring in. Some said it was proof. Proof of what? That something smart lives or used to live up there. Others rolled their eyes, but the fire had already caught. Now, the real science folks? They weren't so excited. One expert looked at the same photo and said it's not a real door. He said it's just broken rock. Old sand turned into stone over time, cracked in two spots, and the bit in the middle crumbled out. That's all. No aliens, no secret base, no little green builders. But who listens to boring answers when the fun ones are so much better? Here's the kicker. That doorway, it's only about one foot tall. One foot. A kid could barely crawl through that thing. That didn't stop people. If anything, it just made the theories grow. Tiny Martians, anyone? Maybe Mars has small life, clever life, building things their own way. Who said visitors have to be tall? The science guy kept talking, though. He said the place where the robot took the picture was full of these old sand hills. Over the years, the wind packed them down into rock. As things shifted, cracks popped up. Sometimes those cracks look strange. People's brains love patterns, love to see faces, shapes, meaning, even when there's none. Still, the internet doesn't stop. It never does. This doorway joins the Hall of Fame of weird stuff spotted on Mars. People have seen all kinds of things in these pictures. Shapes that look like spoons, a squirrel-shaped rock, a pile of pebbles that looked like a campfire, even a shadow that reminded someone of a woman standing with a dress. Every new picture brings new guesses, new hopes, new whispers that maybe, just maybe, something's out there. But the scientists? They've heard it all before. They've seen blurry shapes and bumpy rocks turn into grand ideas with a simple zoom and a lot of imagination. And each time they try to steer the ship back, back to data, back to reason. Yet people don't stop looking. They never will. One photo is all it takes. One angle, one trick of light, one funny rock. And suddenly the red planet feels a little less empty. There's something about Mars that keeps pulling people in. The dusty colors, the wide empty spaces, the strange shapes that show up where they shouldn't. It's like a playground for curious minds. They grab every photo, every frame, blow it up, zoom in, brighten the shadows, chase the corners. They hunt for anything that doesn't look like the rest. That tiny doorway wasn't the first time this happened. Not even close. Years back, someone pointed out a face on a hill, just a shadow and some bumps, but the internet grabbed it and held on. There was also a rock shaped like a crab and something that looked like bones, even a thing people called a Martian bear. Each one lasted for a few days, then vanished when the next odd shape showed up. When the picture of the doorway came out, it was different. It looked sharp, not fuzzy or weirdly lit. It had straight lines, clean edges. That made it look like something real, not just a shadow trick, not just a blurry lump. That photo gave people fuel. The team running the robot explained what really happened. They said the rock was part of a layer formed millions of years ago. That layer, once just soft dunes, had been turned to stone by time. Then stress built up in the rock. It cracked. One piece fell out. The robot just happened to snap the photo at the right time. Nothing made by hands. 
just plain old nature. That didn't slow anything down. People kept posting, kept guessing. Maybe the robot missed something. Maybe something was hiding. Maybe someone made the crack look like that on purpose. It's not just wild guessing either. Some folks build whole maps of the planet, marking every strange thing they spot. They link one rock to another, trying to tell a story. The story says Mars was once full of life, maybe even cities. They look at every dip and bump like it's part of a bigger message. Sometimes they even tie it all to old stories from Earth, ancient stories about gods from the sky or flying crafts made of fire. They say those stories came from people who saw things long ago, maybe from another place, maybe even from Mars. The doorway photo gave them one more piece, one more clue. They said it looked too perfect, like it had been made. Not like the rest of the land, not like the messy piles of rock. It had a shape, that shape gave it power. And in a world full of noise, one good picture can go far. It can spark ideas that race from screen to screen. One frame of stone, and the hunt begins all over again. The doorway became more than a rock, it became a symbol. If a tiny Mars door caused a stir, wait till you hear what floats in Venus's sky. Imagine floating high above a deadly planet in a giant science balloon hunting for alien life. Sounds like science fiction, but this is the real plan to explore Venus, the planet closest to us. And guess what? It might be the only place in our solar system where we could find living things today. Not on the ground though. Venus's surface is a nightmare. Way too hot, way too heavy. Your spaceship would melt, your robot would explode. But up in the clouds, that might just work. The idea is simple but clever. Instead of sending rovers or landers, we send balloons, big ones. Ones that float in the thick atmosphere where the temperature and pressure are kind of like what we feel on Earth. Not perfect, but good enough. And this is not a brand new thought. The old Soviet Union tried it back in the year 1985. They flew two balloons for nearly three days. Those balloons had little science labs on board. They made it through toxic acid clouds and wild winds. For technology that old, that was pretty impressive. Now, with better tech, people are trying again. This time, the plan is to build floating science stations that could stay up there for years. And one group from a famous university has a name for it, EVE. It is not just a pretty name. It stands for a project that might change space science. EVE would float above Venus using smart tricks borrowed from the robots sent to Mars. But this time, it is all about staying alive in the sky, not crawling on the ground. Here is the trick. The air on Venus is filled with something called carbon dioxide. That is a heavy gas. If you want to float, you need a lighter gas. The Soviets used helium. That worked, but helium is tricky. It slips away easily. Eventually, their balloon sank. But this new plan, it uses something smarter the EVE balloon would make its own lighter gas from the air around it. How? With a machine that breaks apart carbon dioxide, you take one carbon and two oxygens, rip off an oxygen, and now you have two new gases, oxygen and carbon monoxide. Both are lighter than carbon dioxide, so they float. And that means the balloon can stay up without using helium at all. All from just using the air around it. That is smart. But balloons need more than lift, they need power. It is not enough to float if you cannot run your machines. Here comes the next cool part. That same gas-splitting machine, it can run backward. Instead of using electricity to split gas, it can mix gas to make electricity. That means when the sun goes down, and on Venus, that takes a really long time, the machine becomes a tiny power plant. It burns the carbon monoxide and oxygen, and that keeps everything running. On top of that, carbon monoxide is flammable. That means EVE could use it to steer, maybe even power little rocket drones. The balloon becomes a flying base, with its own lab, its own fuel, and maybe even little helper bots zooming off to do side missions. And it would not just be one balloon. 
this system is small and light enough that we could send many in one go. A whole squad of science balloons floating across the clouds of a deadly planet, all searching for answers. Now what would these floating labs actually do? Two things. First, study volcanoes. Venus does not have tectonic plates like Earth, but it does have volcanoes. Big ones, active ones. They shape the surface and might explain a lot about the planet's history, but nobody has ever seen one erupt in real time. With special sound detectors on the balloons, they might hear a volcano explode and go check it out. They could float over it, sniff the gases, and maybe even drop a tough little probe down into the mouth. The second goal? Look for alien life. Not green people or space monsters. Tiny stuff. Microbes. Floating in the clouds. Not crazy if you think about it. In the year 2020, scientists found something weird in the air on Venus. A gas called phosphine. On Earth, that gas mostly comes from life. Not always, but most of the time. And it does not last long. If you find it, something made it not too long ago. And if it is in the clouds of Venus right now, maybe, just maybe, something is alive up there. The area where phosphine was found is between 34 and 37 miles up. That is right in the sweet spot. Not too hot, not too cold. Air pressure is decent. Like Death Valley on the hottest day ever, but manageable for machines. Eve would float right in that zone, sniffing the air, looking for signs. The gas is tricky though, it does not stick around, it breaks down. So if it is there, it must be getting made again and again. Either there is some strange chemical thing going on that we do not understand, or something is living up there, tiny alien life floating around. It is a wild idea, but not impossible. Volcanoes and microbes are the big targets, but they are not the only things worth looking at. Venus is wrapped in mystery, its clouds move fast, faster than the planet spins. Scientists call it super-rotation. They do not know why it happens. Studying that from inside the clouds might tell us more. There is also lightning. Venus has strange flashes of light in its sky, but nobody is sure how it works. Some say it is like Earth's lightning, others say it is not. A floating lab could fly right into a storm and find out for real. Even the shape of the clouds matters. They form odd patterns some that look like giant waves. These patterns stretch across the whole planet. What causes them, we do not know, but we might, once we have eyes inside the storm. Then there is the chemistry. Venus has sulfuric acid in its clouds. That is dangerous for machines, but also interesting. If life can survive in acid, that changes what we think is possible. Eve's tools would test the air, test the droplets, look for anything unusual anything that looks like cells or patterns that suggest something alive. Old photos from the surface show flat rocks and cracked ground. They look like dried up lake beds or old lava flows. Maybe Venus once had oceans. If it did, where did they go? The clouds might hold clues. Is there leftover water, heavy water, traces that show how the planet dried up? Eve would carry many instruments, Cameras, microphones, gas sniffers, radiation meters, each one could run for weeks, months, even years. And with a whole bunch of balloons, we could cover more ground. One balloon finds something, others move in. Teamwork in the sky. Some balloons might stay still, floating with the winds. Others might move around, pushed by gas jets or falling weights. Together they map the winds, track storms, chase volcanoes and search for gas trails. The big bonus? This plan does not cost much. No landers, no heavy gear, no landing rockets. Just balloons, launched and forgotten, sending back data every day. As long as the sun shines, the system works. When night falls, the gas engine kicks in. Power keeps flowing, the lab keeps running. Floating labs are one thing, living on the moon? That's a whole new game. Forget comfy homes and white picket fences. Let's talk about the moon. Not just camping up there with high-tech tents, but real living. Cities, neighbors, pizza deliveries. Could it ever happen? Everyone talks about Mars or Venus like it's the final level. But the moon, it's just hanging out there.
less than 250,000 miles away. That's like a weekend trip, not a whole mission. You could go there, build stuff, come back in under one week. No time warp, no getting stuck on a different calendar. Now think about moving stuff. To get a city going on Mars, it would take around two billion pounds of gear. Sounds huge, and it is. But the moon might need the same amount. Just because it's smaller doesn't mean it's easier. People still need air, food, power, and all the other boring but life-saving stuff. But here's the kicker. A rocket can zip to the moon in three days and come back just as fast. Mars, that trip takes many months. One round trip can chew up two years. Even if you had a thousand rockets going to the moon, they could pull this off in a few months. No need to wait for the stars to line up like with Mars. Now, hold on. The moon is not all fun and quick trips. That place is angry when it comes to temperature. At night, way below freezing. Think minus 280 degrees Fahrenheit. In the day, try cooking a pizza on the sidewalk at 260 degrees Fahrenheit. Computers would melt, literally. A fancy glass dome sounds cute, but it is a bad idea. You would cook inside. Best bet, bury everything under dust. That moon dust called regolith can keep things cool and safe. Even better, you might mix it with gluey stuff to make fake concrete. That keeps the heat out and the danger from space rocks and solar storms. Speaking of danger, do not expect a sky up there. The moon's atmosphere is basically zero. On Earth, we have one billion molecules floating in each cubic centimeter. On the moon, maybe 100. That is nothing. The sun would just blow any thicker air away. It has no shield, no magnetic bubble. Earth has one. Mars kind of does. The moon, nothing. And then there is gravity. On Earth, gravity holds you down nicely. The moon only has about one-sixth of that. Might sound fun until your bones and muscles start complaining. Could you still live there? Maybe, but probably not forever. You would need rotations, one year on, one year off. Keep things fresh. Still, the short trip time makes things easier. Do not want to stay. You can leave in a few days. That is not an option on Mars. Once you are there, you are stuck for a long time. Let's talk numbers. The moon's surface, 15 million square miles. Asia fits about 5 billion people on its land. So fitting 50 million folks on the moon does not sound crazy. Now how about air? That same moon dust holds oxygen. One cubic yard of it packs more than 1,300 pounds of the good stuff. Humans only need less than two pounds a day. You could breathe for two years off one load. You just need machines to grab it. Water? It is there too, frozen in craters, locked in dust. You bake it out, trap the vapor, and you get water. Purifying urine is also a thing. Astronauts do it. Food is next. You cannot live on dried meals forever. Vitamins vanish over time. Grow leafy greens, stay alive, no scurvy allowed. Space kale saves lives. Last up is power. Solar is a good start, but there is something better. Helium-3, buried in moon dust, made by the sun. We do not have it on Earth, but just 200 pounds of it. That could light up a small city for one year. That kind of energy changes everything. Should the moon belong to everyone, or just the first to take it? Smash like, drop your thoughts in the comments, and subscribe for more Wild Space Talk.